Welcome to Pause to Go, the podcast that's all about making the most of life's transitions from middle school through menopause. I'm your host, Bree Luck, joining you as we embark on a journey of self-discovery and questionable decisions. Get ready for heartfelt conversations, expert insights, and personal stories that'll have you laughing, crying, and saying, thank goodness I'm not alone. If you've lost your midlife crisis survival kit, we've got you covered. So join me, won't you? And together, we can pause to go. Welcome to Pause to Go. I'm Bree Luck, your host, and today we are going to hear the stories of midlife transformations of Pause to Go listeners. I put out a call a few months ago for people to share their stories of midlife transformation. And the reason is, I know how much we need to hear about people like us who do something crazy in midlife or do something transformative in midlife or evolve or grow or change or find something new in midlife. And that's what we got. So today you'll hear stories of personal transformation that I think you'll really, really enjoy. And if you have your own story that you would like to share with us, please do. You can go to the Pause to Go podcast Facebook group and leave us a message, or you can go to the website. I'll link both of these in the show notes, and you can leave us a message there. There's a little tab, and you can leave an audio message on the tab on the website. I love to hear your voice. So thank you for being a part of the Pause to Go community, and let's hear some stories of midlife transformation. Hi, Bree. It's Susan Burke here. I saw your post on Facebook today and thought maybe I would just tell you a little story and you can do whatever you want with it. Life is full of twists and turns. What you make of them is what's important. When I moved to Charlottesville 18 years ago, it was my full intention to spend my retirement acting. Although I'd always wanted to be an actress when I, quote, grew up, it turned out to be an elusive dream. A steady paycheck became more important than pounding the pavement in New York City. So I compromised. I was in advertising during the day and acted in off-off-off Broadway theaters at night. But eventually, work became more than an eight-hour day. Acting became less frequent until it disappeared altogether. Jump ahead to retirement. Now, I thought, now I can spend as much time as I want on the stage. And at first, all went well. I performed in seven plays over the course of three years. But then the world literally tilted. It was difficult for me to maintain my balance. Years of searching for a diagnosis finally resulted in learning that I have vestibular malfunction and cerebellar ataxia. Now that's a mouthful. Basically, it's a progressive neurological condition with no cure. But on a scale of 1 to 10, it's not all that bad. I just have to walk carefully. But walking on and off the stage in the dark, no less, is definitely an impossibility. At the same time as this life-changing realization, I lost the man in my life. So I bit the bullet and went to a therapist. She was lovely and remarked that I seemed to be very good at using my brain to assess my situation but perhaps not as capable of feeling my emotions with my heart. Not sure of how to accomplish that, I began writing poetry, then many memoirs of my life, and printed them up for my family and friends. I became engrossed in writing, which led to taking classes to learn how to do it well. That led me to writing my first novel, The Witness, a murder mystery, courtroom drama, and story about reincarnation all rolled up into one. That book took four years to complete and was published when I was 78. The next one, The Traveler, only took one year. It's about a kidnapping, a courtroom trial, and out-of-body and near-death experiences. Both have been published on Amazon. Now, at 80, I'm nearly finished with the third Mind Out of Body book, The Message, which is about after-death communication. 
My health condition necessitated a major detour in my life. However, I have found more joy, satisfaction, and delight in writing than I would have ever found otherwise. In addition, I've learned a tremendous amount about spiritualism and the possibility of an afterlife. That's not something I'd ever given any credence to before, but now, after six years of research, it's difficult to deny that there may be something to it after all. Opening up the door to that possibility has resulted in profound changes in how I see the world. If I may say so, I've become a slightly better person, more interested in how I can help others while I'm here. Currently, I'm spending time with senior citizens, helping them to experiment with writing. They seem to be enjoying it, as do I. I love that Susan found a way to move through challenges using her creativity to really make deeper discoveries. So inspirational. Next up is Matthew, who made friends with his shadow self in midlife. Here's Matthew. Hello, my name is Matthew Reynolds, and I'm a culture creator. And I'd like to share what midlife transformation really solidified my authenticity in the world. And that is becoming friends with my shadow. Shadow to me is something that was created out of the indoctrinations by the status quo and dominant culture that was always feeding me these lies and half-truths about how I should be in the world, who I should be in the world, how I should react and respond to other people in the world. And a lot of times it fed on the idea of self-worth being negative, that I'm not worthy of this, that I'm coming from a place of scarcity or coming from a place of unknowing that my truth and my authenticity was worthy of being in existence in this world. And so the transformation that occurred is that I actually became friends with my shadow, that I realized instead of fighting against it, pushing against it, wanting it to not be a part of my life, I actually wanted it to be a part of my life. I wanted it to show me the things that I don't want to be and how I don't want to be in the world and really have a mirror to hold up to how my true humanity and my authentic self embraces other people's humanity and allows them to begin to see the truth of themselves as well. And I think one of the biggest times that that occurred for me was when I transitioned from being a high school teacher into having my own business and being an equity consultant. And as I stated before, a culture creator. So I realized that I was listening to Shadow and feeling I had something to prove and was staying in the classroom and having this saviorism kind of like mentality that Shadow was feeding that I can persevere and, you know, grit out this and and do it for my students. And nowhere in there was me and the authenticity of me. It was all about feeding Shadow and the status quo and the dominant culture's idea that I have to have this career that, you know, I stay in and do these things. And in all actuality, if I really wanted to change the discrepancies, the inequities that I was seeing happening to my students, the hurtful and harmful things that were happening to my students, I personally couldn't do that in the classroom. And I needed to step away from teaching, gather some of the skills that I had already had and and get some new ones to create my offering of crafting your equity lens to the world. And so this isn't a pitch for selling my equity lens workshops or anything like that. This is to tell you and share with you that that transformation, that embracing of shadow and saying, oh yeah, you're teaching me the very things that I don't want to be and how I don't want to be in the world. You're helping me cross-check my authenticity and hold me accountable to letting the truth of me be in the world. And I want to thank you, Shadow, for that. And therefore, I became friends with Shadow, and it was a huge transformation for me. And I hope that other people can make friends with Shadow or find another word for it if that doesn't suit you, but really see Shadow as a place of learning and know that it is feeding your growth, feeding your transformation and feeding you to becoming the biggest, fullest, and brightest you that you possibly can be 
in this lifetime. Thank you for taking the time to listen. I hope that this message finds you well. May it embrace the authenticity of you as you move forward in the rest of your day. I love that Matthew took something that was frightening to him, that was a little bit dangerous, the shadow self, our darker sides, the parts of ourselves that we don't want to look at are really scary. And that he has not only looked at his shadow, does not only look at his shadow self, but continues to embrace it and to learn from it. That's something I'm definitely going to carry with me moving into the next week. I also love stories of people really remembering something that they wanted to do and leaning into it, just like this story of Anna Ma, who remembered an old dream and went for it. Oh, hi, my name is Anna Ma. My midlife journey is kind of weird for most people. <laughs> I came to the States to learn filmmaking. And then for waiting for my uh, husband to graduate from his PhD. And then I, I kind of studied a PhD too. But, you know, I were kind of, I, I was already like, um, after I got my first uh, master of fine art degree, I, and I went back to Taiwan, I was already 33. So I came back here and then because we got some, broke up something to, you know, about, about long distance. And then I came back to the States and, and kind of suddenly decide, uh, to pursue a PhD because I'm waiting for him. But then after we got married and in the States, uh, we have two, two kids. So for the following 20 years, I did not touch any film. I did not even have time to watch films. I was so busy. And then suddenly after they went to college, I kind of, you know, although I still, I don't have, I don't have money at all. The, the only thing that for these 20 years I continue is I, I kept writing script and I joined a script writing group and I actually uh, have like a two or three scripts ready. So last year, uh, I suddenly uh, decided to really make a micro budget film called Romeo and Benvolio. I wrote the script in two months and then started making it after in the summer. And then, uh, surprisingly, I, God bless me, I finished the projects and then the whole thing, I have a lot of help from my friends and even my, uh, um, old friends in uh, Missouri, she uh, helped me uh, finish the final touch of the, the film coloring and sound editing. And then surprisingly, I really finished it this year in April and I'm like, you know, promoting it uh, everywhere. So that that's my story is kind of weird that I stopped a real kind of role that I want to pursue in the States. I stopped for like 20 more years and then I restarted it. The whole thing that with the 20 years in between and, and, and then you restart after middle age because right now I'm like 58. So it's, it's kind of weird and fun thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. For, uh, uh, for me and maybe for most people that, uh, the, the experience I, right now, I am still experiencing, but it's kind of fun. Yeah. Thank you. I love that Anna found her calling again and found her way back to filmmaking after such a long hiatus. What a beautiful story. The next story is more of an internal journey. It's about reconnecting with intuition and with an inner knowing. Enjoy this tale of a midlife transformation from Sabina. Hey, Brie. The abridged version is a lifetime of bipolar disorder and psychosis, depression, when my mom died in 2013, it was the beginning of a spiritual awakening. And then three years later, everything fell away. My relationship with my dad became incredibly toxic. And I woke up one day. I kicked out an abusive boyfriend. I gave up alcohol and I came off psychotropic meds I'd been on for 14 years. And that was the beginning. It was all an instantaneous moment 
And over the next six, eight weeks, I was flooded with (laughs) all kinds of psychic and intuitive information that I had been numb to from drinking and being on psychotropic meds. I had not been in touch intuitively because that sensitivity was numbed out because of previous instability. But suddenly I reframed it and I no longer needed to be numbed out to create stability for myself. And it's been a learning journey in understanding my intuitive abilities and how to use them to help other people and healing really deep, profound layers, a complete disconnect from everything that I had known and loved before. I was a jockey and horses were my life for 45 years. And all of a sudden, that passion just dissipated. And I was sent in a completely new direction. And I'm still in the process, but so much has been revealed and anchoring of talents I didn't know I had. And that's really, it's incredibly liberating, releasing beliefs and conditioning that I had been really trapped by or that I had caged myself by. And it's an incredibly liberating experience. So I'm just about to create a course in spiritual awakening for people that are in the midst of it or beginning to feel like their current life does not resonate with them. And uh, anyway, that's the abridged version. So lots of love. I love Sabina's exploration of both deepening her intuition and connection to her inner knowing and also appreciating that this is a lifetime process not something that has a quick, a quick fix or a, a quick ending or a quick happily ever after. The next story also includes career transformations and a deep inner knowing, maybe metaphysical knowing, although this knowing comes from the father of our storyteller. This is a story from James. Hey, Bree, this is James Sanford. From 1997 to 2009, I was working at the Gazette, and I was originally a staff writer, and then I got moved up to special section editor, and I was a film critic. I was doing a lot of entertainment writing, interviewing a lot of celebrities, that kind of thing. And in 2009, I took a buyout because it was quite obvious that things were getting pretty dicey in the newspaper world. So I was offered a very lucrative buyout package, and I took it and went to Martha's Vineyard and lived for three and a half months and um, basically gathered material and wrote a book and that sort of thing. But after I tried to get back into journalism in uh, 2010, I started to realize just how terrible the market was. And I wound up accepting a job that was at like 40% of my previous salary. And things were very, very tough. I eventually found a better position, but it was just a one-year contract and they had the option to renew. So even if I wanted to stick around, there was no guarantee. So I was really in a predicament and I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. And I was extremely fortunate after I was searching around for a while. I was approached by a guy from Alamo Draft House. They were about to open in Kalamazoo, close to where I lived. And he interviewed me for a position at the theater. And then I had a few more phone interviews and a Google Hangout and a breakfast meeting with the vice president of operations. And then I was flown to Austin, where I got 10 more interviews with people. They were very, very particular about what they wanted. But finally, after three and a half months of interviews with various people, I did get the job as a creative manager at Alamo and basically 
completely overhauled my career. It was very interesting because I had been in theater management back in the late 80s up to the mid 90s with various companies. And I had done a lot in terms of promotion. I'd won some national contests with film promotions. But when the opportunity to, to get into journalism came along, I said, oh, that that's cool. So I did that. And I never thought I would return to theater management. One of the interesting things that I look back on now, my father, when I was going through like the worst time of my job search back in 2010, said, I keep having this vision that you're working in a theater, but it's a different kind of movie theater. It's like, it's hard to describe. And I was just, oh my gosh, dad, give it a break. I'm never going back to theater management again. And he passed away almost one year to the date of when I accepted the offer from Alamo. And so he did not see my transition to Alamo, but it was so funny when I first set foot in an Alamo, I said, I wonder if this is what dad was having visions of, uh, because it was certainly a different kind of operation. And so, yeah, I, I made the career transition and it was, it was difficult. I mean, changing uh, so much relatively late in my career, but it's worked out. I just celebrated my 10th anniversary with Alamo. I love that story of James' father having the vision of him working in a different kind of movie theater. I think that's just so cool. Also, for those of you who are in Charlottesville, you can find James at Live Arts. He's in Kinky Boots right now for the next couple of weeks. So go check it out if you can get tickets. He does both movie theaters and stage theaters. Next up is my cousin Betsy. And Betsy is just wonderful at helping us reframe some of the negative narratives around aging. I think you'll really enjoy what she has to say about moving into the next phase of life. Hey, Bray, it's your cousin Betsy. I'm really intrigued by your recent social media posts about midlife and midlife crises, and I've been peripherally following them for a few weeks now. But I don't see aging as a crisis. I see it as an opportunity, especially for women. As I stand with my back to my youthful days, I only see freedom ahead of me. Freedom to start a new path when I retire, freedom to follow my soul mission and life purpose of mindful living, freedom to live comfortably without needing to work my ass off to make a buck, freedom to sleep in every morning if I want to. There's a whole lot of freedom with becoming an aging woman that we don't think about. Our kids are independent, so we have more freedom to enjoy our lives, whether single or partnered up. Many of us live healthier lives, so we have more freedom to just pick up and go skiing for the weekend or biking with friends. I mean, I didn't even start cycling until I was 55 years old, and now it's one of my greatest joys. Of course, there are downsides, high blood pressure or cholesterol, heart disease, breast cancer, osteoporosis can affect lots of women over 40. So it's extra important to stay on top of our health. When I say to people that I'm 61, they don't believe me. Most times I don't even believe it myself. I'm 61 years old. That's impossible because I believe it's how you live your life that determines your age. When you're younger, you stack the blocks, you create a foundation for a life. You work hard, you raise your families, you do everything you're supposed to. But you can only see the blocks that you're laying on top of each other. But when you get older, you've already built that cathedral. You've climbed to the top of it. And now all you can see are possibilities. Right now at this moment, I'm seeing the life I've been envisioning and manifesting. I'm standing at the cusp of greatness. And I got to tell you, I'm so excited. I have a year and a half before I can retire from teaching. And then my life becomes my own. Believe it when you hear a life begins at 50, because for empowered women who've laid the groundwork, it absolutely does. Thanks for asking our opinion. I'm really happy to give you mine. Love you. Betsy is such a badass. Taking up cycling at age 55, 
I can't wait to find what I'm going to do at 55, but I know this, I'm going to call Betsy when I hit my first roadblock because she really knows the way through. What a positive mindset. Sometimes though, we come to an age and we realize that we have to grapple with some of the things that didn't go so well. Our final story today is about a person who knows that love and compassion are the way to move through, even when life has gotten very, very complicated. Hi, Brie. I have a story of resilience. I'm 50 and I'm divorced twice. But my last divorce was extremely traumatic for me and my entire family. And I guess my story is this is the other side, the story in the light instead of the darkness and how I feel and know in my soul that the more sadness you feel, if you can just keep going on, if you can keep um, connecting with yourself and loved ones around you and tending yourself and loved ones around you and looking for the little things in life every day that make you feel good inside, you can get to the other side. My divorce made me take a hard look at who I am and the good and the bad and the good parts of me. I'm a super empathetic person. I love people. I'm super optimistic about people. I tend to always see the good in you. And if I can't find the good, I'm immediately looking for why the bad is there. And those qualities led me to choose a person as a a romantic partner that was really harmful to me and my family and my children. And make a choice in life to put your children in harm's way. I think we all as mothers know that that's one of the worst feelings you can feel. I kept saying to my friends, well, at least my kids don't, you know, my kid doesn't have cancer. My kids don't have cancer. But I kind of felt like I had made choices that had put an emotional cancer in them, not by anything I had done, but by the choice I had made in a partner. So it was ugly. And it was it was the lowest of lows for me. And I hope for my lifetime. But what I learned in the end was I am such a better person now for it. I am incredibly strong. I have no doubt that I can take whatever life has to give me. I can take it. I'm ready. And I am able to experience joy to a deeper and higher level than I ever have in my life. I I can see the light every day in something. You had to fight for it. You know, I had to fight for it. And therefore, I really appreciate it. And so for everybody out there who's suffering in some way, I know it sounds cliche, but it's really true that on the other side, there is a silver lining or like a tree. You know, there's an old saying out there about a sadness being the roots of the tree and happiness being its canopy and that the two are always in balance. And I think that's so true. And it's a beautiful metaphor because the canopy goes up into the light and the and the roots go down into the dark. And we know that we need both in life or there's always going to be both. And don't be afraid. You can get back into the light. You just have to keep going. I love that metaphor of the tree and the branches reaching up towards the light. And the roots needing to dig down into the darkness to get the nutrients for the tree. I just think it's, it's really beautiful. And I'm so grateful for all of the stories that listeners shared today. I'm so grateful for you. And if you got something out of this episode, please share it with a friend. And also, please subscribe. So recently, Apple changed their algorithm. And so people who had previously been subscribed were unsubscribed. So if you have just a moment right now to go and click follow or subscribe wherever you're listening to the podcast, 
it will make a huge difference for this podcast and will bring it to the ears and eyes of more people wherever they catch their podcasts. Thank you so much for pausing to go with me today, and I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Pause to Go podcast. Special thanks to Codebase Coworking and WTJU Radio for their support. This has been an Awkward Sage production.